Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Oh, how I've missed you all. And I saw some comments stating that there's a lot of people that miss my intro. <laughs> Thank you so much. I told a lot of you that I will be posting my story about what I went through. I'm not going to do that in the introduction. I'll make that the very first story of this video. In the meantime, if you like what you are hearing down in the description below, you can buy me a coffee. It helps me and the channel out. As well, you could become a member of Backed Ashes for only $1.99 a month. It includes perks such as you get videos a day early, you get priority responses in the comments, and many more perks. Now, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm and enjoy these twisted, scary stories. Okay, everyone, I will make this short and sweet. That way we can go ahead and get into the story so that you may drift off to slumberland. There's been some ongoing health issues with me over the past few years. And for those that would like to know, I am 38 years of age. <laughs> I just had a birthday back in February. Anyway, it runs in my family. My mother's had it, my brother's had it, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, I became the victim of it thanks to my genes, heritage, whatever you want to call it. I had what you like to call internal and external hemorrhoids. And also, I had a very nasty torn fissure. I am sorry that is graphic in nature, but that's exactly what happened. So, I had to go get a colonoscopy, and then I had to go see a colon rectal doctor. And with that being said, after he looked at everything examined, he determined I needed surgery. And they knock you out. They put your feet up in these stirrups. You're not awake during all of this, but it still petrified me. <laughs> they shave everything down and they go in and do whatever it is they do. They remove the hemorrhoids and sew up the fissures and everything else. I just remember coming to, I was still kind of numb and out of it from the anesthesia. And... I got home. I felt wonderful walking on cloud nine. They told me as soon as I got home, take my pain medications. I sure did. I could not sleep to save my life. But the very next day, I also felt great. I think it's still because of all the drugs they put in me while I was in surgery. And it wasn't until about three or four days later that the pain really kicked in. So I'm so sorry that I did not get back to all of you all in the comments. But... I am feeling much better, and there's still some pain going on, but nothing too intolerable. I'm just taking it day by day. With that being said, whenever I mention the coffee crew, and I mention that it helps me in the channel, the coffee crew, whenever you buy me a coffee, it's sort of like tipping your narrator, and I truly, really, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate that. As I took that way for a rainy day, well, that rainy day came faster than I thought it would. I knew I couldn't record for a while, it was driving me insane, and I had one donor who wishes to remain anonymous that sent me $200 in coffees. I literally sat and cried, but after thinking about it for a while, I finally decided to get me a desk. It's one of those desks that either lower or they raise, that way you can stand in case you're sitting too long. Because as the doctor said, I'm not allowed to sit too long. Because it puts pressure on my bowels and where I had surgery. So, you'll hear, or actually you won't hear, I'll edit that part out. But anyway, so I will narrate a little bit sitting down. And then I can raise the desk and narrate standing up. So, I don't care what it takes. I miss my studio. I miss you all so, so much. And... Last but not least, thank you to my coffee crew. Every single one of your dollars went to a good cause, and it's helped me recover and get back in the studio. So thank everyone that donated their hard-earned money. I really, really, really appreciate you. And I'm going to stop talking about that before I actually start crying. So thank you all so much for helping me. Thank you all so much for the love that you poured out. Thank you for your messages. Um, I'm not just putting the coffee crew above everyone else. The love and support from you all has 
my supporters for this channel. I really do appreciate you. Your words and love got me through uh, this time. Yes, you all think I should still be laying down and healing. Trust me, I'm doing that. But I had to get back in my studio. I have to put videos out. As I said, this is my full-time job. Each day that I lay around and I don't put a video out, I'm losing money. And this is what is paying my bills. And two, you all can't go to sleep without vocal melatonin. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you all are probably getting bored listening to the stories that you've already heard time and time again. So I wanted to bring you something fresh. I am starting with this genre. And of course, while I was laying on the couch for almost a week, <laughs> I collected a lot of stories. So I've got a lot coming to you all. I know I said I would start the membership benefits next week, but what I'm going to do to get myself caught up, I'm going to release the video Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then starting next weekend is the cutoff date. We will then go to members get early releases, and then everyone else gets to see the video. It's only fair to the members who pay their fees every month. They've been patient with me. Um, the week before surgery, of course, me missing surgery, and they're still patiently waiting for their benefits to kick in. So it's only right. It's only correct. Okay. I think that's long enough. Just know that right after this story, there will be an ad. So, with that being said, let's move on to these twisted, scary stories. Just a few more pounds. My wedding is in two days. I've been dieting, exercising, calorie counting, and doing everything in my power to scale down, to fit in my dream wedding dress. I know it's cliche, but I found the perfect dress years before I even met my fiancé. I damn well planned to wear it. I never had a mind for marriage, but when I saw this dress online on a closing shop's website, I knew I had to have it. It's stunning with a long crystal studded corset, sweetheart neckline, the works. The bustle had a train covered in lace with doves flying, outlined in Swarovski crystals. When it arrived, it was more beautiful than words could express. The only problem was I didn't have a fiancé, and it couldn't be altered. I would have to work to fit in it, so work I did. My soon-to-be hubby is the perfect man. He knows just how important this dress is to me, and he's helping me exercise multiple times a day. We might be too exhausted by the honeymoon to even enjoy it. Regardless, he's doing whatever he can to help me shed the pounds. I haven't had sugar in months, no bread, no alcohol, nothing fattening. All my favorite foods are off the table, but it's totally worth it. Over the past three years, I've shed pound after pound. I had liposuction, my stomach banded, and tried every fad diet there is to try. I've had my excess skin removed and had ice treatments to freeze my fat away. I've even sweat away in saunas trying to lose that extra weight. I put in the work, but this dress is just stubbornly small. I love it so much and refuse to get married in anything else. My parents had footed the bill for a stunning wedding. 
So the date can't be changed. It's everything I've ever wanted. But I've run out of time. Today I tried it on again. It's tight. Ugh, too tight. I just don't have time for anything else or any other solution. Sometimes you have to go to extremes to get what you want. This is my dream wedding, my dream man, and my dream dress. The only option at this point is to give up my pound of flesh, or five, to make it happen. I hope I have enough gauze and plastic wrap to keep any blood off my beautiful dress. Long enough to get married and dance all night long. After all, marriage is all about sacrifice, right? Four four one. Growing up, I always felt uneasy living on my highway. It was out in the middle of nowhere. My grandparents owned the only store that was close, which, surprisingly, being next to the highway and being the only store for miles, didn't get a lot of customers. Honestly, I didn't think much of the strange occurrences. The lights coming on, scratches on the roof of my room, noises coming from the woods, and most of all, the deaths. A man had passed away in my grandparents' room a few years before we moved in, but nothing ever came of it. A few years ago, my grandma started seeing orbs or shadows. She said there was a light-colored one and a pure black one, and they never brought harm. But the black one would always seem to try and get to my grandma, but the white one would stop it just before it could reach her. Around the same time, I started to dabble in spirituality. Tarot cards, black salt, Greek mythology, and such. I believed and still believe in ghosts, demons, angels, even skinwalkers or skinnies, as I call them. I can recall a few instances where I truly cannot forget. The time a skinwalker was in the woods, waiting for me and my grandma to come even a step closer. Strange occurrences when I was alone in the house. The uneasy feeling that something was always watching me. Hell, even the nightmares. And times that I woke up in the middle of the night. The top three that terrify me the most are the stories I'll be sharing now. Instance 1 This was back in 2021. My neighbor had given me her three cats she couldn't care for anymore. Well, the two bobcats were outside, while the other cat was an inside cat. The inside cat got pregnant, or was pregnant, when we got her. She cared for the babies, but one day she had went outside. She never came back. She always comes back. We went looking for her near the wood lining, but I didn't see her. I had seen the back half of a cat, however, and right after that, the flashlights me and my grandma had showed a little bit of a shadow. And when I say that thing was huge, I don't know what it is to this day. But I know it wasn't a wild animal. 
instance, too. I had watched a movie that was claimed to be haunted. I can't recall the name of it, but it was a weird movie. Well, while watching it, I was alone. And surprise, surprise, it was storming outside. Well, halfway through the movie, all the power went out. And I heard a sharp, screaming type sound blast through my headphones. I almost cried. I'm not gonna lie. I don't know if it was something to do with the movie I watched or what. And here is the last instance. The nightmares. I had just gotten comfortable sleeping in my own room due to past trauma. Well, it was all good at first, until the nightmare started. It was excruciating. I could feel the pain with each gunshot or cut or cat accident. My dreams were so vivid to the point I forced myself to pull an ungodly amount of all nighters. Not to mention the times I would wake up to my speaker being on or inclines and in volume from the TV. I'm not saying these instances are related to the abnormalities of life or ghosts, but please, whatever you do, don't move onto Highway 441. The Wide-Eyed Lady in the Window I experienced this last year, around February or March. I'm from the Philippines, and as you may have heard, we have a lot of beliefs here. I didn't really believe in paranormal events until this happened. So, I live in a house with my aunt and cousins, along with my siblings. There are a total of five people in the house at that time. Helping and fixing the table was the thing while my Tita did the dishes and fed the dogs. My older brother was asleep at the time, and while my two other cousins were playing in the living room. After I fixed the table, I went to my room and took my towel. I felt like something was watching me, but I didn't pay attention too much. I took a shower, and I heard a screeching sound outside and thought it was the dog. And then, I heard my Tita's voice. I went to my room to change my clothes when I felt that feeling again. The feeling of someone watching me. I heard my Tita's voice again, calling my name this time. Then, I looked at the window. I saw a face. I thought it was my aunt playing tricks on me, so I called her out. But then my aunt spoke to me that she was in the living room. My whole body felt cold. I looked at the window again. It was still there, staring right at me. With those wide eyes, I wasn't able to move or do anything. I was standing there, and it felt like my feet were glued to the floor. I wasn't able to run or even let out a scream. Her face was rotting, and her eyes almost poking out. I fought myself and ran as fast as I could, grabbing a towel to cover my naked body. I went outside my room and hugged my aunt and I cried as hard as I've ever cried before. My whole body was shaking. I told her about what happened, 
and after that, she let me sleep in her room with my cousins. It's been a year now, but it still terrifies me. We moved to a new house with my mom and my older brother. I don't feel anything here. Not even someone watching me from the window. Crawl. I had been chosen by my boss to go to a conference out of town. I felt excited at first that I would get out of town for a few nights. I lived in a city that was rather small, so the idea of going to a more metropolitan area was refreshing. I was looking forward to trying new restaurants and doing a little exploring of the shopping scene. I was hoping that my hotel would be closer to downtown, but unfortunately, I had found it to be a little out of the way. It was listed as a hotel online and had some pretty nice pictures, but when I got there, it had more of a rundown motel vibe. The first day of the conference was long. It was a lot of socializing with people from other companies, mostly small talk. Once I got to my hotel room, I set my bag down on a dresser. Then, I went to strip off the comforter because only God knows that amount of times it has actually been washed. I looked down at the comforter that was now in a heap on the floor and saw that the bottom part of the comforter had a dark stain on it. It was faded, so I knew the comforter had been washed at least once. I further inspected the sheets on the bed and didn't see any other stains. I kicked off my shoes and laid down on the bed. I began to scroll on my phone and when I realized one hour started to creep up to two, I hit the lock button on my phone and set it down on the bed next to me. I stared up at the ceiling. I didn't really focus in on the popcorn effect of the paint until I saw one of the bumps start to move. Something was crawling along the paint. I squinted and realized it was an orange bump, more commonly known as a ladybug. I thought it was a little strange that it was on my ceiling, but it was the middle of October, so it probably wasn't that strange after all. I went to the bathroom and grabbed a wad of toilet paper, preparing to take a life. I wasn't a big fan of killing things, no matter how small. I hated bugs, being in my space, but I also didn't believe it was necessary to kill them. Apparently, I haven't always been this way, according to my mother. When I was a child and there was a bug in the house, I would volunteer as tribute. She also said half the time I would run up to the bug and vice grip it between my thumb and pointer finger before she even had time to hand me a tissue. She told me that ladybugs had been my favorite insect to kill because I had liked the way the shell crunched between my fingers. I have no memory of this. I returned to the bed and jumped up on it to try and reach the ladybug. Of course, I was too short. I felt stupid thinking that I could have reached him. I pathetically attempted to jump up and grab him. He began to crawl away from me. I tried to jump higher, reaching desperately up to the ceiling, barely even touching it. 
I'd gotten too close to the edge of the bed and jumped up to reach for it one last time. I landed one foot on the bed, but the other foot missed and violently threw my body off balance. I fell awkwardly onto the crunchy carpet, just barely missing the dresser. When I hit the floor, I heard something. It sounded like a little boy had let out a giggle. I felt a sudden intense fear of being watched. I looked around the room, but obviously didn't see anyone. I ran to the window. It had been slightly cracked open, and there was a group of high school-aged boys in the parking lot. I assumed they had been staying there for a sports tournament or something. Because I could see multiple of them wearing blue and white Letterman jackets. They were laughing and chasing each other around the lot. I went to close the window and saw that there had been a slight tear in the screen. I assumed this is how the ladybug had gotten in. On the other hand, I was relieved that there were explanations for the things that caused my fear. Then, on the other hand, I felt uneasy about the idea of the window being open. For how long and all the insects that could have crawled into the room. I thought about calling the front desk to possibly switch rooms, but I didn't. I didn't know if that kind of information would be relayed to the company I worked for, and this was my first time I had been chosen to go out of town. I didn't want to be seen as being picky or difficult by my managers if, by chance, they got that information. I wanted them to see me as a team player. I decided to have some food delivered to my room while I took a shower. I ordered a pizza with pepperoni, green pepper, and pineapple. I was excited to know that the entirety of it would be for me, and I could choose to eat it all in one sitting or ration it out. It might have sounded silly, but the idea of having the slight moment of control was exciting to me. After I showered, I watched TV until my pizza was delivered. I ate half the pie and then folded the box in half to squeeze into my room's mini fridge. I was exhausted from eating so much and lay down. I woke up the next morning to my alarm going off at exactly 6.30 a.m. I did my usual morning routine of showering blow-drying my hair, applying my makeup, and then getting dressed in my business casual attire. I headed to the location of the conference. I was unsure why at the time, but walking out of the hotel released a very heavy feeling on my shoulders, and I felt like I could breathe better. When I returned to the hotel... My routine had been very similar from the day before. I threw myself down on the bed and began scrolling. I didn't get to spend as much time on my phone, though, because I had used it so much more often during the day. The constant forced conversations with strangers was beginning to drain me. I had escaped twice to sit in the women's restroom, and once to sit in my car. I sat on my phone all three times and spent way more time away from it all than I should have. I pulled my phone charger out of my purse on the bed and reached over to plug it in to the lamp right next to me. I saw another ladybug crawling across the side table towards the light of the lamp. I shuddered and wondered if there had been any bugs next to me while I slept the night before. 
I went to the dresser and picked up the wad of toilet paper I had set down the previous day. It was part of a failed attempt before, but it wouldn't be this time. I still had difficulty getting the courage to pick it up, but I did ever so gently. I didn't want to crush it. I just wanted it gone. I walked into the bathroom and threw it in the toilet. I stood over it and watched as the toilet paper slowly opened up while the water soaked into it. I could see the ladybug trying to crawl out from under it. Its silhouette was getting closer and closer to the edge of the paper, almost escaping. Right before it reached the very edge, about to be free, I grabbed the lever and flushed it again. I put the cover over the seat and washed my hands. I grabbed the pizza from the mini fridge and turned on the TV. I began watching ridiculousness on MTV. I saw a drunk man jump onto a beer pong table, collapsing it. I laughed at the stupidity, and then suddenly stopped when I saw two ladybugs begin to fly around in the light from the screen. I looked at the TV in disbelief. I didn't understand how two more ladybugs could be in my room. I got up and grabbed my shoe. I smashed it into the TV, colliding with both ladybugs. I killed two bugs with one shoe, and I was proud of myself. Suspicious, I walked over to the window. After throwing open the curtains, I found the window cracked open again. I closed the window and made sure it was locked. I told myself that it must have been housekeeping. I looked around the room for any sign that housekeeping could have been in the room while I was out. I saw the reflection of the open bathroom in the mirror, across from it that was hanging on the wall. The mirror across from the bathroom and next to the front door was visible from almost every angle of the room. In the reflection, I noticed two perfectly folded towels on the sink. I looked up above the toilet and noticed a vent. I wondered if that could also be where the ladybugs had been coming from. I hadn't seen any ladybugs in the bathroom, so... I shrugged off the thought and decided to blame it on the window again. I went to lay in bed. I left my shoe where I had dropped it on the floor below the TV. I also left the smudge of insect guts on the TV screen. I went back on my phone and scrolled until I felt tired enough to go to sleep. The next morning... I got up and was ready to head to the conference. I looked over my clothes carefully before I put them on, just to make sure nothing had crawled into them. I felt on edge and paranoid, but also ready to kill anything small that I saw moving. When I got out to the parking lot, I looked up towards the window to my room. The curtains and window were still visibly closed from the previous night. I thought, they better stay that way. When I returned from the conference, I looked down and inspected the bed before laying down on it. I was exhausted from the day of socializing, but I wasn't careless. I closed my eyes, afraid that I was going to see a ladybug crawling on the ceiling. It took me a couple of minutes before I felt the urge to open them. I got a familiar feeling, like I was being watched. I opened my eyes and saw no ladybugs on the ceiling. I looked over at the nightstand and saw nothing crawling on top of it. I looked at the TV and saw nothing swarming around the screen. 
I nervously peered over at the mirror that gave me a full view of the bathroom and its reflection. Nothing. I felt so silly. Not ready to give up. I walked over to the window and pulled open the curtains. I looked down and saw that the window was fully closed. I even tugged on it to see if it had been unlocked and it didn't budge. I walked over to the bed and laid down again, a little defeated. I became quickly bored. I started scrolling on my phone again. I'd gotten to Twitter and began reading a tweet from Chrissy Teigen. I scoffed after realizing her hiatus from the app was very short-lived, and everyone knew it would be. It seemed all too common for celebrities to make big declarations on how they will remove themselves from toxic situations. Chrissy Teigen felt targeted and bullied, so she left Twitter. Sometimes I get annoyed by all the back and forth. Someone famous does something wrong. Thousands, sometimes millions of people swarm their social media accounts, telling them they are horrible people. Then, they should be ashamed of themselves. Sometimes people even tell them that they should die. It is a horrible cycle. The celebrity will then take a step back from the social media, but then come back to it. But the people who were swarming their social media are just waiting, all for the cycle to just happen again. They may leave, but they always come back. They always come back. They always come back to the hate and the... I was lost in my own train of thought when I almost let out a scream. A ladybug started to dive bomb my phone screen, attracted to its light. I threw my phone across to the other end of the bed, but it bounced off and hit the floor with a thud. I looked all over to see if the ladybug had landed somewhere on me, but it disappeared as soon as it had appeared in the light of the phone. I got up and started looking around the room again. That's when I saw another ladybug crawling on the mirror. I chose my shoe as a weapon for the second time and brought it down on the ladybug, hearing the crunch as it was fed to the glass. I lifted the shoe when there was the tiniest smear from where it had been in its final moments. I felt disgusted. I walked into the bathroom and began to wash my hands vigorously. I then decided to strip off my clothes, deciding a shower was the only way I could feel clean. I took extra care in scrubbing my skin. It started to turn red as it became irritated by the rough hotel bar soap. When I felt I had scrubbed as much as I could, I got out of the shower and grabbed my used towel that was hanging from the door handle. I shook it hard three times to make sure nothing had been on it. I then tightly wrapped it around myself. I walked over to the sink and began to brush my teeth. That is when I felt it. I looked down and knew what it was before I even saw it. It was another ladybug crawling up my leg. I swiped it away with my hand and saw it fall to the ground. I noticed that it fell among two more that had been crawling on the floor, right under the sink. I gasped. I ran out of the bathroom to grab one of my shoes. When I bent down to grab my shoe, I heard it again. It was a faint giggle. I froze. Goosebumps covered my arms and legs. 
I felt nauseous from being overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. Then, the light in my room turned off. I ran to my bed and grabbed my phone to turn the flashlight on. I began waving my phone around the room. I didn't know what I was looking for, but the fear I felt was starting to take over. I was shaking. Think logically, think logically, think logically. I began to think over and over to calm myself. I was panicking in my locked hotel room. There was probably just a power outage. I was freaking out for no reason. I started to walk towards the bathroom with my phone light leading the way. That's when I noticed it. It was about five feet away from the hotel room door and the light switch was right next to it, pointed down. I had flicked it up when I had returned from the conference. I slowly panned my phone flashlight to the right so it was shown in the mirror that provided me a view of the bathroom. I gasped again. It felt like all the air left the room. In the mirror, I could see a hunched over figure on the floor. A thin, pale, naked man was crouched on the floor of the bathroom. He was staring into the mirror at my reflection with wide, crazed eyes. An uneven smile started to spread across his face. I felt sick to my stomach and had an intense feeling that I was going to die. I stared into the mirror at the man, frozen in place. He stared into the mirror at me. Then he started to crawl out of the bathroom. I knew he was going to come after me. I no longer was frozen in fear. My survival instincts kicked in. I ran straight for my hotel room door because I knew very quickly that the man's full body would be in the way of it soon. I could feel the man's bald, cold head as I kicked it with my knee. I screamed. I tried to quickly unlock the door, but I felt the man grab my leg and then my arm with his cold hands. He yanked himself up quickly using my limbs to raise himself. I tried to push against him. He fell back slightly into the bathroom. I undid the chain lock on the door and pushed on the handle. I felt a slight breeze of air as the door cracked open slightly. Then I felt a strong push. I fell hard down to my right and into the mirror on the wall. I heard the glass break as I hit it and fell onto the floor. Parts of my body were burning. I knew I had been cut by the glass. The man began to climb on top of me, and I let out another scream. I began crying out for help. Someone had to have heard me, and someone has to be coming to help me. I looked into the man's eyes. They were empty black dots. I quickly looked away, disgusted. I saw my phone laying on the ground the light of the flashlight making this horrific experience all the more visible. Then, all of a sudden, the surge of anger began to flow through me. I reached my hand down where I felt a stabbing in my side. There was a large piece of glass poking out of me. I wrapped my hand around it and brought my hand up fast, stabbing the man's neck. My face became flooded with a warm liquid, and I closed my eyes and mouth and continued to bring the piece of glass in and out of what I knew was the man's body. I didn't stop until I heard the hotel room door open. I heard somebody else scream. 
I didn't know if it was the man or the person who came to rescue me. I threw the piece of glass down and struggled to move myself out from under the man. Once I was free, I crawled backwards and lay down on the ground, exhausted and crying. I looked up at the ceiling above me and saw something crawling along the ceiling. Loves a bitch. I've never been much of a talker, even in my job. I say very little. Where to? Would be just about all you got out of me, majority of the time. But this time, my passenger was far too intriguing for me not to say absolutely nothing. Where to? Follow that red car. Her voice took me by surprise. From under the dark and oversized hood that engulfed her was a sweet, tender voice. Okay, no problem. I'll admit it. It wasn't the first time I've heard those words as a taxi driver. But usually, it included a drunken boyfriend, a drunken girlfriend, and some sort of drunken dispute. So, who are we chasing this evening? I asked with a smile. Husband? Boyfriend? Still no response. Girlfriend? My memory vaguely remembered a woman jumping in the red car just before. I'm not chasing anyone. Just follow it, please. She removed her hood and revealed her simple beauty. Chocolate brown hair, cute little cheek dimples, and a dark purple circle around her right eye. A tiny cut above her eyebrow indicated it had only just happened. Jeez, lady, uh, are, are you okay? I'm fine. She looked kind of sad, perhaps a hint of anger, but mostly sad. Do you want me to take you to the hospital or the police, maybe? No, just follow that car. She spoke so flat yet calm. I felt slightly uneasy, but I was worried. The, uh, the person we're following to... They hit you? (sighs) Yes, she said with a huff. She did. Why? Why did she hit me? Yeah? Silence. Sorry, I I don't normally get involved with my customer's business, but I have to know that my passenger will be safe, you know? Yeah. She seemed to weigh in the clouds. She doesn't know what she does to me. Every time I see her or hear her voice, it melts my heart. I can't imagine not being with her. I had to at least see her. Her face turned to full sadness this time. I really felt for her. I've been there. Love really is a bitch. The red car slowed and parked up ahead. I thought I'd do her a favor and pull over early so the woman didn't see us. She thanked me, paid me, and went on her way. I contemplated calling the cops just in case, but she was my last customer of the night, so I headed straight home. I'll be honest, a few minutes down the road, I'd completely forgotten about her. The next day, I turned on my kitchen radio as usual to listen to the news. Again, Rachel Jane Jones, local famous actress, died tragically last night from stab wounds after being followed home by an avid female fan 
who, the police have said, had been stalking Mrs. Jones for some while. It is reported that after hitting the assailant with her bag, Miss Jones was then followed home by the stalker via a taxi and was then stabbed six times in the chest. We'll have more on that later. In other news... Oh. Shit. Appalachian Horror This story takes place in the early 1990s. I was 18 years old and started my new life as a college student. It was an exciting time to be away from home for the first time, and my best friend and I both committed to West Virginia University. We were ready to party like no tomorrow, together. We weren't the brightest and were just going to college because that's what was expected of us. So WVU was the perfect fit. We chose to be in a quad room, meaning we would have two other roommates. Both were random and this was the time before cell phones. So we wouldn't meet them until move in day. Being from New Jersey, this was the furthest from home I would be, and the change from any New York City suburb in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia, would be shocking. Monday day came, and my friend and I set up our room. Our first roommate joined us that day, and we all clicked really well. He was from a really small town in western Virginia, and although we had almost completely different lives, this was someone you could tell would be a great friend. The next day, our other roommate came, and we all got to know each other. The story revolves around the first roommate from Virginia, so I'm going to focus on him. Throughout the semester, my best friend, the roommate, and I became a trio and would go out together all the time. And we all even shared the same friends. We really spent all of our free time with each other. Things remained amazing for both semesters of our first year, and we really wanted to keep in touch over the summer break. My home friend and I were so intrigued by the third roommate's stories of his hometown that we all agreed to visit him for a week over the summer and live with his family. When that time came, me and my friend hopped into my car and drove the roughly 12-hour trip to his house. About an hour after passing through the suburbs of D.C., we realized how remote Western Virginia was. When we would stop for gas or to use the bathroom in these small towns, we felt like we were in an old Western movie. I have never seen so many people and so little urbanization. It was really eye-opening. We arrived at his house by dinner time, and when I tell you this town is small, I mean it. Each house was at least half a mile or more apart, and it took a 25-minute drive from his house to get to the center of town, where all the stores and restaurants were. Honestly, although it was an extreme change from what I was used to, I pictured this trip being a relaxing one, removing me from the hustle of the East Coast. Three days into our 60-day stay, our friend wanted to bring us hiking through the mountains. I was really excited as I had been loving the outdoors here and really wanted to embrace nature. We started our hike at about 9 a.m., planning to eat our packed lunches around 11 and bring her to his house by 5 in time to eat dinner at home. And before it started to get dark, 
midway through the hike, a little after we eat lunch. I stopped. A no trespassing sign was in the middle of what seemed to be nowhere. I asked my friend about it, and he told us there was a house in there that everyone knew to keep away from. He told us that where we were hiking was designated as a park and, therefore, no one could live there. But this family had been there for so long that after refusing to move numerous times, the state just gave up. This was so intriguing to me, and I really wanted to see the house. My friend kept telling us it was dangerous because it was someone's property, and they could shoot us if they saw us. The way he was telling us this, I thought I felt a little insecure as if he didn't really think that was the problem. I interpreted this as him just thinking they wouldn't shoot us without warning us to leave the property first. So, I begged and begged. After pulling the usual, you only live once, or, come on, we're best friends, we need to do this. We finally convinced him to lead us towards the house. We had walked for about 25 minutes when we noticed a clearing in the trees. My friend told us once we saw the house, we're going to stop because, at this point, we were about three hours from any road in any direction. And it was really dangerous if we would be seen. We started to whisper and walk slower, waiting for the house to appear. Suddenly, we heard a little scream, like a child when they're playing a game or happy. We froze and started to inch closer to the noise. Soon, we saw an old rustic house that looked like it should be condemned, with rusting metal tools and wheels in the front yard. And then, we saw a little boy running in circles, laughing. We watched for about five minutes and noticed that the boy wasn't playing with anyone else. It was odd that he was playing this long and this intense by himself, but we didn't think too much about it. My home friend wanted to get closer, but even at this point, I felt scared. The friend from here told us it was really dangerous to get any closer and that we should start heading back, now, as it was around two, and we needed to stay on schedule. My home friend wouldn't budge. He said he wanted to see if other people were on the property, and what they were doing. We agreed to stay at our distance, but moved to the side to get different angles of the house and hopefully see someone else. That's when we noticed a tall, heavy man walk out a side door and scream at the boy. Not a scolding scream, but like an animal scream. This was a sound I had never heard a human make before, and I couldn't even imagine what it meant. The boy screamed again in this animalistic howl and ran inside the house, we all looked at each other like, what the F did we just witness? Then, like out of a horror movie, another scream erupted, but this time behind us. We whipped around and saw a boy behind us, probably 12 or 13. We were caught. My heart started pounding so hard I could feel it in my skull. Another scream came from the direction of the house, and we saw the tall man coming for us. He didn't have a gun, though, so we all felt he was about to scold and not kill us. 
We decided to act lost and just ask him for directions to town that way. And maybe he would go a little easy on us. When he got close enough to hear us, we all started pleading with him, telling him we needed to get home soon and asking if he could help us in any way. He just began screaming at us, and the young boy behind us pushed my friend forward like he was telling us to move. We started to inch up, and the tall man started to walk back toward the house, and we all assumed he wanted us to follow him. Now, we are a couple of yards from the house, and the whole family went outside to look at us. There were two very old women, two middle-aged women, and one middle-aged man, three young men probably in their 20s, and like eight kids. We could tell that they were all related, as they all had the sandy blonde hair and deep blue eyes. No one said a word to us, We were so scared and confused that we kept pleading, but they didn't even look like they understood us. The tall man from earlier throws us a makeshift plastic carton of water, and someone starts making their way inside. He took this as him letting us know he wasn't mad at us, but it was time for us to go. We picked up the carton and... It was disgusting. The dirt on the clear white plastic stained in brown and the water looked septic. As we turned our bodies to walk in the other direction, we all noticed four girls tending to plants behind the house. These girls weren't outside with the rest of the family staring at us, and I assumed that they were workers there. I know that makes no sense, but they look nothing like everyone else, and I thought it was weird they didn't join the family before. They all had brown or black hair and were considerably paler than the family. As we continued walking into the woods, one of them yelled at us in incredibly broken English in the thickest hillbilly accent you could think imagine. Don't come here no more. Daddy kill you. We were shocked. This was the first time anyone tried to talk to us. We yelled back that we were so sorry and ran into the woods. It was around 3.30 and we were terribly behind schedule. Our friend's mom would pick us up at 5, but there was no way we would get back to the road in time. During the whole walk and jog back, we discussed what had just happened and how weird that entire affair was. We were all so baffled, and the local friend interjected that growing up, there were always so many scary fables about that house and family. He said some people said they were here since the 1800s, and have only ever interbred. And they're all like genetic horrors now. And others said they were cannibals. He told us he brushed all these stories off as tales, but we all agreed that the interbreeding one could be a real possibility. Finally, at almost seven o'clock, we make it to the road when we see our friend's mom's dad's and brother's car they were all in a circle talking and when we greeted them they said they were worried sick and were about to go looking for us we apologized and got into the mom's car while she laid into us screaming and crying she told us how scared she was my home friend apologized and told her how we got caught up at that house. Immediately, the whole car went silent, and the local friend looked at us 
Like, why would you say that? I thought he was mad because we admitted to trespassing. But now I know that would have been a godsend. His mother sternly said, You didn't speak to them, did you? At this point, we just told her the whole story, and she sat silently the whole time, not asking any questions. Nothing. She told us we'd have to go home tomorrow, cutting our trip two days short, and that we seriously put ourselves in danger by doing what we did. The next morning... We packed and got ready to leave after breakfast. The mood had visibly changed, and my friend barely spoke to us. I was still feeling a little cheated out of my vacation, wondering what we did that was so bad. We left a couple of hours later, and that was that. The next semester, we all decided to room together again with the exception of the fourth roommate, which we tried for a new one. A couple of months into the semester, we were all drunk on a Saturday night and ended up talking about a memory from our summer get-together. With a lot of liquid courage, I brought up the event again and asked what we did that was so wrong. My friend tried to blow off my answering and my persistence and his inebriation finally gave us an answer. When he said change me forever, apparently that family really had lived there since the 19th century in that exact house. Soon, they got shunned for revoking their religion and the town didn't really mingle with them anymore. This led to the start of their inbreeding. At first, they only wed cousins, but by the late 1950s, when the state had claimed the whole area as a park, and this was the only family to remain for miles, the inbreeding got worse and involved siblings and parent-child relationships. The police did a few welfare checks on them in the 60s to confirm this but there was really nothing they could do about it. In 1971, a local girl from the town went missing. After weeks of searching and rescue turned up nothing, it was assumed she had died hiking in the woods. Eight years later, another school-aged girl went missing, this time the sheriff's daughter. Again, after weeks of looking, nothing turned up. The police decided to go to this family's house and ask if they saw her, being that they lived in the forest. It was thought the girl got lost in, and to the sheriff's surprise, his daughter was there living with the family. Apparently, the sheriff also recognized the first missing girl, who was now pregnant. This part is now all folklore and no actual confirmation, but many of the locals believe it to be true. Apparently, the sheriff found out that the family was desperate for some outside breeding to help clean the gene pool and would kidnap young women and sexually assault them. Luckily, the sheriff's daughter hadn't yet been impregnated and the sheriff took her back on one condition. He had to allow the family to take the young girls, mostly from other towns, and the sheriff would look the other way. Some people in the town believe that if they mess with the sheriff, that he would approve the kidnapping of their children. And because of this, many adults in the town appease the sheriff's office at any expense. Since then, there have been reports of missing girls from other towns, but no one knows if they simply got lost in the Appalachians or really have been taken. 
This is why our friend's mom was so mad at us. She was worried we would mess up the relationship between the sheriff and the family, and somehow they would have to pay for it. I'm not sure if I believe any of this, and it still boggles my brain to this day. I just hope it's not true. There is someone in my house. God, please send help. If you are reading this right now, help me please. There is someone in my house. I was just sitting on my couch watching a show when I heard glass shatter and footsteps somewhere upstairs. I knew to hide inside my closet and I called 911. I live in Nevada, so the closest police station is nearly an hour away. I will try to apprehend the person and will update you in a few minutes. It's not possible. There is nothing wrong. No broken window. No damage. Nobody in my house. I've checked everywhere. The only thing wrong is the gun under my bed is gone. I'm scared for my life. I will update you soon. I think I see someone outside. They are just standing there. Oh God, they are getting closer. The person knocked on my door, telling me my window was broken. They said they lived nearby and saw someone strange near my house. I welcomed the person in as I didn't want to be alone while checking the window. He left. The window was not broken. We couldn't think of a reason why we both heard the same thing. At least the police are almost here. It does take them a long time to get here. After all, I live in the middle of nowhere. Wait a minute. I don't have a neighbor. (laughs) And that, dear listeners, is the end of these twisted, scary stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you are awake and listening... I hope you have enjoyed this collection. I am so happy to be back with you all. In the meantime, I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or 